everyone, welcome back to our podcast called The Research Behind Lift the Lid, where we talk to researchers previously funded by Australian Rotary Health about their research findings. I'm Jessica Cooper and today on episode 22, we will have a chat with Professor Philippa Hay from Western Sydney University. Professor Hay was awarded a mental health research grant from 2006 to 2008 for her project called Mediating Factors and Effects of Health Literacy in Course and Outcome of Common Eating Disorders, a longitudinal study. Professor Hay is well known for her work in eating disorders. She is a past president of the Australian Academy for Eating Disorders and a current chair of the National Eating Disorders Collaboration Steering Committee. In 2020, she received the Senior Research Award of the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Psychiatrists. She is committed to research that results in a better understanding of eating disorders to reduce the individual, family and community burden. Her current research focuses on randomised controlled trials of interventions for anorexia nervosa and other eating disorders, as well as public health and community interventions that will reduce barriers to accessing care. So thank you very much, Philippa, for joining me on today's podcast episode. How's everything been going for you lately? Oh, very well, thank you, despite COVID. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a challenging time for a lot of people at the moment. It is, it is, yeah. it is. But we seem to be getting through it, which is, which yeah, is good. Yeah, I guess, yeah, humans are resilient. So, you know, we, we keep going. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I know it's been quite some time since um, your mental health research grant project finished um, back in 2008. Um, 12 years have passed since then, but um, I saw that a new paper has just come out called um, Effects Associated with the Use of Healthcare for Eating Disorders by Women in the Community, a longitudinal um, cohort study. Um, so that was also related to that grant project um, and has been published recently in the journal uh, BMG, BMJ Open. So um, would you like to talk us through what you did in this particular study and, and what resulted from it? Yes, thanks. And thanks for this opportunity to really um, talk about the results and, and disseminate and bring the results to the wider audience and particularly to the audience of people who may have contributed in funding in the early days. For this study, we recruited um, around 400 to 500 women um, across Australia, across three states, in fact, of Australia, um, for a longitudinal study of sort of health and well-being and mental health literacy regarding um, or around eating disorders, but also other psychological symptoms over time. And the present paper that you referred to um, refers to years two, four, and nine of this survey. So those were the years from baseline to year two and year four and year nine of the survey. And in those years, um, the participants in the survey, the woman in the survey, had been sent emails um, or postal surveys on various aspects of what we call health literacy, which is really understanding of illnesses, of disorders, and their treatments and outcomes of those disorders, as well as general aspects of health, um, both mental health and, and physical well-being and health, and their health use. So what we abbreviated in the study to HCU or healthcare utilisation. So what people were doing about their health, both in terms of formal um, treatment, seeing doctors, seeing psychologists, um, seeing specialists, but also informal treatments. So the use of social support networks, for example, or other complementary medicines um, in the community. And in the study, we investigated the relationships between healthcare use over time and also people's mental health related quality of life and mental health well-being, both in terms of eating disorder symptoms, but also in terms of general symptoms such as depression and anxiety. And in this study, we found that only one of five or 20% of the participants had sought specific um, specialist eating disorder type help, um, help for their problems with eating or other psychological health problems. So that sort of gap in treatment seeking is something that we've been observing and is something that really underpins the main aim at the beginning of this research project, the longitudinal project. And we found that more than half of the people had sought help that was not 
what we would call evidence-based, so not based on randomized controlled trials or things that were published in peer-reviewed journals. However, both formal and informal, that's the less evidence-based um, care that people were seeking, were both associated with small improvements in eating disorder symptoms or um, levels of problems people had in regards to relationships with food and eating behaviours. So also, <clears throat> also healthcare use was associated with improvements in mental health related quality of life and in reduction in general psychological distress or depression and anxiety symptoms. But we didn't find that over time people's mental health literacy was associated with that healthcare use, which we thought was a very interesting finding because we thought if people were seeking healthcare use that might improve their understanding of disorders and also their, their treatments and outcomes. And so our conclusion was really around that issue and also, particularly given the high rate of informal healthcare use, that we need more research and more understanding of what that is and how we might be able to help healthcare use or healthcare providers or when people are seeking help to actually improve people's understanding of their disorders or their health literacy. Mm, yeah, that sounds very interesting, especially yeah with yeah informal um, interventions being you know just as effective. Um, I guess, um, what, do you, what do you think about those results? Um, well, as I said, we always, you know, being a good academic, I would say we need further research. But um, I think the results really highlight that we, we can't ignore the informal use because it did have an impact and that we need more research that really um, cuts across the broad range of things that people are doing to help their mental health and well-being in the community and not just focus on those that we think are what we think they should be doing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so obviously that, that paper that's just been public, published was, yeah, it was part of um, the grant project that was um, funded by Australian Rotary Health, um, you know, all those years ago. Um, I, I guess what, what led you to um, start a project like this and what were you aiming to achieve? Well, the project really started because we knew that there was this what we call this treatment gap. We knew that there were many people in the community with problems and particular problems related to eating disorders that when we weren't seeing in clinics, that in clinics we were only seeing the tip of the iceberg as it were, maybe the 10% of people perhaps with the most severe or most complex um, eating disorder problems such as people with severe anorexia nervosa or severe bulimia nervosa, but we weren't capturing even um, a representative number of people with bulimia nervosa, which at that time was the only other recognised eating disorder, or people with other eating disorders which have since become recognised, such as binge eating disorder, probably perhaps less than 10% or around 10% of people with those more common eating disorders were actually receiving evidence-based treatments. So that really spurred the idea, well, how can we understand this better? What can we learn about it? And what can we learn that might actually close this treatment gap? Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I know as well, um, this three year grant would have just been a, a small element of the study. You said it was, you know, you were looking at, you know, nine years as well. Um, but I, I guess just, just for this um, funding period, um, what, what did you find in this research? Yeah, well, the first phase of the research was where we rather, now looking back on it, perhaps rather naively, but also relatively unsuccessfully, we tried to have an intervention that would help people improve their mental health literacy and prompt them into seeking treatment. So that's actually giving people an understanding of the symptoms, so all the things that they were telling us about and where to seek treatment or how to seek treatment for that. And what we found was that it didn't really seem to be having much of an impact. So we did a more in-depth study um, at a follow-up point at about four years of a series of really in-depth interviews, a qualitative study to find out what was happening. And we found that people were encountering many barriers when they did seek treatment, um, particularly barriers in terms of what we now call poor health literacy of the doctors, who would have a very biased view of what someone who has an eating disorder should look like. They should look very thin. So people were often told, well, you're not thin enough, was a very common refrain. Mm. And there was a high level of stigma, which really was across both stigma of having a mental health problem, but also stigma of having an eating disorder and an eating disorder not being seen as a serious disorder, um, either in the general community or by healthcare practitioners. So those barriers that we identified, um, we, we wrote about in a paper um, which came out during the period of the funding, 
and has actually been, been very widely cited because there's very few papers that are really pointed to the more, as I say, behind the scenes happening of mm. seeking treatments. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so, so you said, oh, you, sorry. <laughs> oh, so, so that really spurred us on also to keep following the woman up. So we've now been following them up for nearly 15 years now, oh. since um, 2003 and 2004 when they were first recruited. Hmm. Um, and I, I guess leading on from that, have, have you found anything else? Um, yes, we've had it. Probably every year we've had at least one or two research projects that have been published out of these um, surveys, which we've kept on um, at various years over the time. Um, most recently, um, two years ago, we did a survey and we're doing another survey again this year. But one of the most um, interesting studies that came out was published in PLOS One in 2015. And that looked at what we call bi-directional relationships between a person's quality of life or their life function as it might be impacted by having a health problem, so both physical or mental health related quality of life, and eating disorder symptomatology or what we call the sort of the sort of doctor end of understanding a disorder, which is what are the symptoms. And not only did we find that level of symptoms impacted on someone's health related quality of life, and this was over a nine year period because it's a longitudinal study, but also poor quality of life impacted upon symptoms, which is sort of a bit of a rethink that maybe if we improve someone's quality of life, that will impact on their symptoms as much as just focusing on people's symptoms. Mm. And another, I think, important study from this research over the first five years was that showed the level of um, persistence of symptoms. And that really counters this view that eating disorders are trivial or they just go away or they're time limited. Um, and in fact, that study, which was published by Palavras, um, really showed that eating disorder symptoms they may wax and wane over time, but they're very persistent and their level of impact on someone's life is persistent over time. So they're not things that just go away by themselves. Yeah. Um, I guess, you know, you said already that some of this research, um, I guess, would inform health professionals to, to you know, you know, know more about that and break down the, the stigma. Um, I guess, do you have any other, um, do, do you think that this might have other implications for, for how people with eating disorders are treated? Yes, well, I think um, in terms of real world implications or, or impact that has happened, I think one of the things was, I know that our research probably did inform um, the sort of evidence or the support for the new Medicare item numbers that were introduced last year for people with eating disorders, um, particularly because those Medicare item numbers go across all forms of eating disorder, because I think this sort of research has shown the impact of disorders beyond anorexia nervosa, so also bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder and other specified feeding and eating disorders. And those disorders are now supported treatment specific eating disorder informed treatments are now supported by specific Medicare item numbers mm -hmm. up to, uh, and, and in sufficient amounts, so up to 40 sessions in a 12-month period, which is about what you would need to treat across the spectrum of people with eating disorders. So that was a, a great thing to see. And, um, and I think some of the work that we've been doing and showing the impacts um, and also the large degree of treatment gap for people with eating disorders, I think probably contributed to, you know, supporting that, that introduction. Hmm. Yeah, well, no, that sounds like some great outcomes from that. So yeah, that, that's really great. Um, as as well as from that, um, do you um, is there any future research um, that you've got in the works um, com coming on from this, or are you still doing the study at the moment? Um, yes, we will keep studying the study going um, as long as the women stay with us. Um, obviously, over time. <laughs> Some women have left, which is understandable because it's been a long, long-term period. Um, but we do, um, we have kept in contact over the years and we've often had very um, interesting and helpful responses and feedback from the women who are participating in the survey and we're ever so grateful to them because it would not be possible without their ongoing participation and keeping us up to date when they move houses, et cetera, things like that. So um, if any of them are out there listening, we are... I would like to say a special thank you um, to all the women who have participated in the study. And as I say, we would we'd like to keep um, continuing um, the, the surveys 
over time as well. This year we do plan another survey and in particular, obviously this year we will also be um, exploring the impact of COVID particularly um, for, for this group of women um, who have been part of the longitudinal study. So, so yes, definitely ongoing. Yeah, well, that, that's so amazing that you can do it for such a, a long time, like, you know, having those participants go with you for, for over a number of years and, you know, just mm. continuing that. So I think, yeah, that will bring about some really interesting findings, I think, and has already. Yeah. So, yeah, such an important study. Um, I know that, um, uh, like, one of the aims of this po podcast is to show our Rotarians, who are Australian Rotary Health's um, biggest supporters, what kind of results come out of the research that they fund and, and show that the work that they do raising money for ARH um, can make a huge difference. Um, I guess, could you maybe um, tell us um, how this grant funding may have helped you as a researcher or, or maybe talk a bit about why continuing to fund mental health research is so important? Well, funding is absolutely critical. And again, I'd like to thank all the Rotarians and all the people who have, um, you know, put money in that has supported this and other mental health research. Because um, as much as we would like to, we, we can't do it without, without funding, and particularly funding at critical periods. And the critical period for this was those early years when we were recruiting um, the woman and, and the early engagement, and also in the, as I said, things like the in-depth interviews that we gave, which really require a lot of person time. And, and that person needs to be funded for that person time to do those sort of very detailed interviews. And I must say that overall, um, funding is very less or little in um, Australia for eating disorders and for mental health compared to the, the grants and things that are available internationally in, in Europe and in North America. And I would say we, we do research often in Australia on the smell of an oily rag. You know, it's a, it's what we produce, what we're able to do, I, I think is, um, you know, not um, really just talking about my colleagues here and, and other researchers across Australia, um, the impact that they've managed to have with you know, much smaller size um, funding grants um, than, than may be seen internationally. So we are very, very grateful for that and for that support. Um, yeah. Can't say it enough, really. <laughs> well, thank you for the work that you do. And, and also thank you for joining me on the podcast today. Um, I guess before we wrap up, was there anything else that you'd like to add? Well, I've probably just said it. I think it was thank you to all Rotarians and... Um, Keep safe and we look forward to 2021 and 22 with less COVID. Yes, yes, hopefully. Well, thanks again. That Thank was the you. 22nd episode of our podcast called The Research Behind Lift the Lid. It's always so inspiring to hear what researchers in Australia are doing to make a difference to mental health and how they are helping us on our mission to lift the lid on mental illness. If you can, please support important mental health research like Philippa's by donating on the Australian Rotary Health website. Thank you for listening. Please join us again next time. Mm -hmm.